Good evening. It's uh, 630. So I call this virtual regular meeting of the Littleton City Council for January or not January 4th, February 1st, uh, 2022 to order. Uh, roll call, please, clerk. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Here. Council Member Barr. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Grove. Council Member Milliman. Council Member Valdez. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, note that Council Member Grove uh, did let me know that she would not be able to attend tonight. And Council Member Milliman is on her way. She was trying to get back uh, home from work in the snow. So she should be joining us here shortly. OK. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Next on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had a chance to look at the agenda. Is there any changes? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Um, item three are comments and reports. I'll see. Uh, I'll go to the city manager here first. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I just have one update here for Council. Our city attorney here commented last night uh, via email, of course, that Tri County Health Department are uh, going to let their mask order lapse. And so after the 5th, we will not have a requirement for wearing masks indoors. So I think I just want to let council know that staff's going to be meeting here tomorrow specifically to kind of review that. And we'll be opening up our facilities here. City Hall is an example here. And we'll be moving towards in-person meetings. And certainly the next study session on the 8th will be in-person. We will also work with our boards and commissions to kind of make that transition as well. And so that's just kind of a quick update on that front. And I think I'll share later this week just more details of that as staff works through this. So that's my update for this week. The attorney. And just, just to clarify, so Tri-County's order expires after the 4th. So starting on Saturday, there are no mask orders. Um, I have no other comments tonight. Thank you, Mayor. 
All right, thanks. Before I get to city council, um, I just wanted to have the uh, moderator uh, read to the um, guests attending how they can participate. So Kathleen, if you are there. I am. Good evening, Mayor, members of council, staff, citizens, and guests. I'm Kathleen Osher, Director of Community Services, and I'll be serving as moderator for this evening's virtual council meeting. We're streaming this meeting on cable channel eight, Facebook, and on our website, littletongov.org. Please be aware, comments left on Facebook Live will not be moderated and will not be included in the meeting minutes. Those wishing to participate in any public comment portion of the meeting are advised to listen in on your phone as this provides the least amount of delay. The agenda will be handled by Mayor Schlachter in the same way it would be handled for a regular in-person meeting. As always, citizen participation is encouraged during public comment and public hearings. To participate via phone, please call 669-900-6833, and when prompted, enter the webinar ID 960-1814-0586. There will be one opportunity for citizen participation this evening during public comment. If you wish to speak during public comment, please call in early and stay on the line. Again, the number is 669-900-6833 and use webinar ID 960-1814-0586. When public comment is announced, press star nine to raise your hand to be recognized as a speaker. Microphones will be muted for all citizens calling in. Speakers will have three minutes to address council. The city clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and again, when your time is up. For agenda items, Mayor Schlachter will ask for a motion and a second followed by discussion and a vote. Council will vote on agenda items using a thumbs up for a yes vote and a thumbs down for a no vote. The clerk clerk will call each vote with all the ayes and nays. Again, if you plan on participating during public comment, please call 669-900-6833 and when prompted, enter webinar ID 960-1814. 0586. Please stay on the line and press star nine to raise your hand to speak. Thank you very much. Well done there. All right, let's go through council here. So I'll go, um, Councilmember Barr, have any um, update report? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. And just a, a few quick updates. Um, and primarily uh, for myself in District 3, I'm going to be starting to hold District 3 roundtables where I'm inviting residents of particularly my district, but other uh, obviously Littleton residents are, as well are welcome to attend. Um, starting on February 19th, there should be postcards going out in the mail shortly. Um, please sign up on my website at steveforlittleton.org. Um, so I can get an accurate head count so I can pick an appropriate venue or have to check transition to digital or virtual meeting if necessary. Um, other than that, I have no other updates from the LPS Dr. Cog uh, liaison ships and just wanted to wish uh, Mayor Schlachter a happy birthday. Thank you. Um, and um, I'd just like to note that Councilmember Milliman is now here. It is 6.36. Uh, so next, let's see, Councilmember Valdez. Happy birthday, Mayor, and I have no report. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Driscoll? No report, Mayor. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Milliman. Hey, sorry I'm late. Long commute home tonight. Um, happy belated 29, Kyle. Hope you had a great uh, birthday yesterday. I have two quick reports. One is from the Fine Arts Board. They are working with the museum on a a mural program and just putting it out there. There's going to be more to come in March, but we're pretty excited about it. Uh, The other report is from South Metro Housing Options. 
So um, just a reminder, the South Metro Housing Options is partnering with Habitat for Humanity, and they received approval in 2021 to reposition um, the pub, excuse me, the public housing policy, the public housing scattered sites. And over the next year and a half, they'll be selling up to 59 single family homes and duplexes to income qualified families. Um, the homes are going to be sold directly to individuals and families who are working with Habitat for Humanity. It also means that Habitat will be able to put an affordability restriction on each of these properties so that if or when the homes are resold, they will remain affordable for the next buyer for many years to come. Um, the first home should be under contract within the next month with several others to uh, closely follow, which is very exciting. Uh, the sale of these affordable homes addresses one of the key findings in uh, the Littleton housing study, which identified the need for affordable uh, starter homes and family homes priced near or below $300,000. It also addresses the policy goals with regards to affordable housing that were identified in the comprehensive plan. And while uh, Habitat has done a lot of work in the metro area, this is the first time they're venturing into Littleton. So both, both organizations are pretty excited about um, the partnership and this great opportunity. And lastly, the, proce the proceeds from the sale of these homes will be used to uh, reinvest in affordable housing options in Littleton to continue to meet the needs uh, identified in the Littleton housing study and the comp plan. And that's it. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Hi, everybody. I have several updates. I met with the Littleton Arts and Culture Commission. And uh, one thing that's kind of a bummer is we lost a decade of growth in the arts and culture sector due to COVID. That's just speaking to the, men, the Denver metro area. So kind of a bummer, uh, which also kind of positions us to really rebuild back some of that and invest in that. Um, the Arts and Culture Commission is gonna be working on a public art ordinance. It's gonna be coming to city council probably in the next few months. So just heads up, you'll get more information about what that might look like and how we could continue to support that in our community. And then just a cool thing, um, uh, ACC has an associate's degree now for fine arts. So that's kind of neat when we talk about just how expensive I think education is becoming that Arapahoe Community College now offers um, a really strong program that's formalized for students who are interested in the arts. So I thought that was really neat. I also met with Tri-City Homelessness Policy Working Group again. Um, there's several things coming down the pipeline for that. Um, you know, there was the, a request to get a coordinator. This was in the action plan that was adopted by the council um, a while ago, and that's like a three to five year plan. Um, so that's coming down the pipeline and that's gonna be a shared expense between the county between Sheridan, Englewood, and Littleton. So there will be some requests for money to help fund that. Um, there is um, ARPA money um, for homelessness and housing. And there's like a lot of it. I mean, 750 million, I think, for housing relief, 100 million for homelessness, um, long-term housing. And so um, SAMA and some other people on this uh, working group, they are in conversations with the state to access that money and find when would, what would be an appropriate funding stream in order that we could partner with um, that fits into our action plan. So I think that's kind of cool. And then the, the work jobs program that was in the action program um, action plan, it actually graduated a couple of its students already. So I think that's kind of cool to see sort of that pilot program come into fruition. Um, I also serve on the Community Services Block Grant Advisory Committee, which is a total mouthful. Um, they are responsible for overseeing a lot of the services and rental applications and meals on wheels, supporting senior housing, um, you know, in the human services department in the county. Uh, one thing that's, you know, housing continues to be a challenge. They had 4,000 rent applications um, last year, and there's a backlog of 1,400 of those applications that they can't even fill. I mean, in December alone, there was $1 million worth uh, in rental um income that they help supply people who, who are in need. So I think that continues to be an issue that we really have to keep our eyes on. So uh, that's all for now. Do you have a question, Councilor Holdies? I, if you can, I do have a, sh a short report. She, uh, Councilman Ryden reminded me of something as she was speaking. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, and it's just regard to RTD. As everyone knows, RTD was having financial problems before uh, the pandemic. 
And now the course got worse during the pandemic. And then now today they're, they're announcing that they are probably going to have um, more cuts that'll be long-term type cuts. So that, that's something we're going to need to follow. Cause I, I know we were hoping for some good stuff to happen on Broadway. So we'll, that's a, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get some more news here shortly. That's it. With that I, I apologize for not. No worries. All right. Thanks. Um, I just have a quick, quick report. One I just met with, uh, Group of Boy Scouts from Troop 462 over at the library just before the meeting here. I walked over in the snow, and so it was good to meet with them and uh, invited them to come to one of our uh, council meetings where we're back in person, and they can uh, um, watch and see what we do and uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, so that was good. I'd also like to acknowledge that today, February 1st, is the start of Black History Month, um, where we celebrate uh, uh, Black History for the next month of February here. And along those lines, uh, the U.S. Uh, Conference of Mayors had a compact on uh, racial equity that was signed by over 150 mayors around the uh, country. I added my name to that and we'll bring it back, the whole compact uh, as a resolution to council so we can discuss that, I think in, in March, sometime in March when we have a, a meeting there. So I just wanted to put that out there and that's all I have for my report. Um, so next on the agenda, item four is scheduled citizen appearances, which we do have an appearance tonight. So that's great. Uh, I'm going to, we have, um, the Ark of Jefferson, Clear Creek, and Gilpin counties, and the Ark of Arapaho and Douglas counties uh, tonight to present to us. And so I would uh, like to welcome the team there and welcome uh, Brent Belisle, who is going to be uh, leading the presentation and talking to us tonight. So I'll turn it over to you and look forward to it. Welcome to our first edition of the Ark. Shepherdson Clear Creek in Gilpin County, along with the Ark of Ababa and Douglas Counties. Welcome. My name is Brent Belial. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at the Ark of Jefferson Clear Creek and Gilpin County. Right now, I'm going to get my colleagues, Valerie Smith and Luke Green, introduce themselves. Valerie? Thank you, Brent. Um, Brent and I work very closely at our chapter of the ARC um, in communications and outreach. Uh, we love when we get the chance to speak with um, our community leaders. And so thank you so much for adding us to your agenda tonight. And um, happy birthday, Mayor Schlachter. And Valerie, can you uh, um, introduce yourself as well so everyone that's listening knows who you are? Yes, yes. I'm Valerie Smith, and I am the Communications and Outreach Director for the um, chapter serving Jeffco, Clear Creek, and Gilpin Counties. Now, Luke. Hi, I'm Luke Wheeland. Um, again, I'd like to uh, second the thanking for letting us talk this evening. I work with the Ark of Arapaho in Douglas County. Uh, so we, we share the city of Littleton here. So um, us and Chef Go, so we're helping out tonight. I'm the Director of Community Outreach, Education and Communications with the Ark of Arapaho in Douglas Counties. So I will be sharing my presentation tonight on my screen. Um, Luke was going to, but his computer is not cooperating today. So um, pardon me while I share my screen. Can anyone not see that? The ARC Fostering Inclusive Communities? All good, I can see it. All right, great, it sounds like we're good. So when we talk so, about the ARC, we talk about our mission. Um, we, we definitely want to break those stereotypes that are out there in our community about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, what we call for short IDD. And these are people with conditions like cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome, autism, and there are many, many more. And what we'll talk about tonight is, um, some specific ideas for an even more inclusive community. Thank you, Valerie, the mission, promote and protect the rights 
of people with indigestible and developmental disabilities, ID people showed support the full inclusion and participation in the community throughout their lifetime, from birth to the end of death, to the end of life, and in kind of rest of their bubble, 4.1% of the population with an IDD diagnosis. What does the fog really do? We promote, we promote the rights of people with IDD faster we can use turn to the next screen. We promote and access the full community life the inclusion and acceptance of people with RDD, of IDD, and all people of, with disabilities. And we do self-determination. And let me talk about me as a sign up. I'm a person with several body. I was born with CP, but I don't let several body stop from letting me do what I do. I'm a member of I'm a violent member of the community. I work and play and live in the temperamental community. I live independently in temples, married, and a monk at. So when we talk to people in the community, and we say, oh, I work with the ARC. Um, they think we're the thrift stores. You know, who hasn't heard of ARC thrift stores? Um, they're everywhere. They're wonderful. Um, but this is always a great opportunity to talk about what is the difference? Um, the ARC uh, consists of chapters like ours. We provide advocacy. We provide information. Uh, we help empower individuals with disabilities to learn to speak up for themselves. Um, and we empower families uh, parents to be their, the best advocates for their children. And so the connection is important, though. The chapters created the thrift stores as a funding source. So we are so fortunate that thrifting is in. Everybody is thrifting. I know I'm addicted to it. The sweater is from the thrift store. Um, we're so fortunate that, that ARC Thrift provides, um, at our chapter, it's about 80% of our funding. And so when you do donate to ARC Thrift or shop at ARC Thrift. You are indirectly helping our chapters. So keep donating, keep shopping, feed that thrifting addiction. Right now we are going to discuss people for the name it. People for the name it is identifying the person first people with a disability. Like, for example, no, we don't use the R word anymore. Yes, we use development of disability. I'm not handicapped. I have a disability. So we are wheelchair bound. No, it uses a wheelchair. Suffer from Down syndrome. Had no, a person 
5,000 Five million views people want to add any more comments. Yeah, Brent, um, the, you know, the ARCs um, are all about inclusion. Um, so people first language is not just um, about treating people with disabilities, making sure that we're putting them first, not their disability. It's making sure that they're seen as the rest of the population is. We don't use terms that with people wear glasses, um, that, you know, like their glasses define them um, and things like that. So that their disability doesn't define someone, um, their abilities really outshine that. Thank you, Duke. I really like what, what both of you have said about that. Um, and I just wanna add to that because I spent so much time with Brent. Um, so Brent is, Extremely hilarious. Um, he's a lot of fun to work with and he keeps me in line. And oh yeah, he happens to have a disability, but it's certainly not what defines him. Thank you, Val. Anytime, Brent. Stay your dives about people with IPD. People think we cannot do much. No, no, no. We live independently help the community and have a full survive sad buying life. I love have low expectations. Sad is a no statement also. People don't think we don't want to do much. We work, get married, pray, learn, achieve in our communities. Unintentional, inadequate, but sometimes, yeah, a lot of people in our community think people with ITT cannot do much. For example, when I come out to eat, with my friends or wife, the waiter asked my wife, what does he want? And my wife said, no, you can ask friend. Friend is very capable on telling you what he wants. Just an example. The truth about people with IDD, we are very capable. We want to be seen for, the, for our abilities, not our disabilities. We have without to give. We want the same everyone else does in life. We want a meaningful life and we all matter to the community. We are viable community members to the communities of Chevco around the most targeted counties and all of other environmental area. So Brent, can I add to that a little bit? Yes. We, um, we at the ARCs, you know, do a lot of these conversations with community members, you know, here with the you know, Council of Littleton and the community members that are on from the city um, there in Littleton, but police departments and first responders, obviously schools and special ed departments, um, the Buell Theater, other sporting events on how to interact with people with disabilities um, and what their, their best ways to include them in their daily activities. And the, the number one thing is just treat them like any other human being. Yeah. Um, we don't have a, a golden ticket or a way that says, if you do this, every person with a disability yeah. will respond to you and be like, you know, able to listen and do this, just like the rest of us on this you know, presentation and call tonight. 
all have our you know shortcomings and, and things we do well. People with disabilities do too. And so it's just really treating them the same way you want to be treated and, and watching their abilities shine when they're out there in the community. Thank you, Mr. Luke. So what we see in all communities to some extent, we see barriers uh, to the inclusion of the people that we serve. And so we just like to bring those to light. Um, one is, is accessibility, but there are two parts to this. One part is the, the curb cuts, if someone uses a mobility device or the, the automatic doors and, and those kinds of physical um, uh, adaptions that are made in the community. But it's really the attitudinal barriers that we find have the most impact on, on the lives of the people that we serve. Um, you know, an attitude of, uh, this group of people can't do all these things or an attitude of, wait a minute, maybe I'm underestimating people and, and they can do a lot more than I think they can. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable to, to engage or interact with someone who's different. And, um, you know, sometimes people feel like they're on the sidelines of the community um, if they have an intellectual or developmental disability because of that. It's pretty universal among the people we serve um, that they have a very hard time to find meaningful work. At the ARC, we couldn't do what we do successfully if we didn't have Brent on our staff. Um, we have to include people who walk the walk. So we, we have Brent on staff and at our chapter, we also have what we call our Outreach Advisory Council. And it's made up of uh, four additional people who have disabilities. And we, we look to them for opinions about activities we put together or communications that we wanna put out there. And the last one is a really big one, transportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, finding a way to get where you wanna go can, can prevent you from going at all. But uh, these, are big, these are big challenges, but it's, it's good to bring them to light and talk about them. When people do face these barriers day in and day out, again and again, it's easy for, for people to get discouraged and even stop trying. And that's when people find themselves quite isolated from the rest of their community. And um, so that's, that's why we enjoy speaking to our community leaders so that they're aware that this can happen. And COVID has hit our population extremely hard yeah. in terms of that self-isolation. Um, our population already struggles sometimes with being isolated because of their disability and uh, mobility or whatever reason. Um, and then COVID has made it harder even still that our population hasn't really returned to even what the normal is now. Um, so, you know, we're, it's gonna take us a lot longer to get back into the community um, with, you know, masks and even safety precautions in place um, coming out of this pandemic. Yeah, that's a really good point, Luke. Thank you. Ideas for greater inclusion for community leaders. Recognize the desire to give to the community and to matter. Be on an advisory and community role. I'm, a, I'm on a lot of advisory of community roles. For example, I'm with the RDGs advisory council for people with disabilities. I've been on it for two terms, so I'm going on my fifth year. Also, I'm, uh, I was a member of the people with disabilities commission for Denver, from the city of Denver. And also you need to be visibility. We want to be seen. We don't want to be on the 
outside the lines, waiting for opportunities. And we start with healthy expectations. You need to see, start with healthy expectations. So to tag on to what Brent was saying, um, regarding visibility, sometimes it's as simple as including pictures in your communications of people with, with disabilities. Um, we could be a resource if, if you get into a situation where you need photos, if you uh, are in a place where you aren't sure about people first language. Um, our chapters would love to be a resource for City of Littleton and you can reach out to us at any time um, if you need that kind of advice. And then regarding the healthy expectations, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. You know, if you, if you see someone with a disability, start with the expectations that they can do a lot of things instead of they can't. Um, and you might be uh, surprised that they can meet expectations that you, that you never imagined. For employers, um, we, do, we do a lot of uh, messaging about how hiring people with disabilities is, is truly good for the bottom line. There's data um, from multiple sources that, that show that that's absolutely true. Um, employer retention is higher in people with disabilities. There are fewer absences. Um, the morale, the desire to work and, and be part of the organization is, is something exceptional with people with IDD. Um, so we love, we love talking about um, reasons why people should hire people with IDD, because there are a lot. Sorry, Colorado is also an employment first state. Um, so we really push employment for people with disabilities. Um, coming out of high school or a transition program, um, we really want people with disabilities if they have the, the drive to work, to work. Um, and there's benefits on both sides of the coin that Valerie kind of talked about here, but also um, overall morality and um, independence skills and just you know self-esteem for the person with a disability. Um, it goes beyond the paycheck for us. Um, people that work with disabilities um, tend to see the paycheck as one positive attribute, like we all do. Um, but the idea of it also creates a safer community for all. Um, people with disabilities, when they work in the community, um, create natural friends, natural supports. And when that person doesn't show up or something's wrong, they reach out and look for them. Um, and that tends to trickle down to other coworkers, disability or not. So having someone with a disability in your ranks um, tends to improve your employees' morale and overall respect for each other. And ideas for greater inclusion, just say hi. Speak to a person with disability. Don't be intimidated. Like you would speak to anyone else and focus on their abilities, not their disabilities. So we work with this every day and, and it's perfectly crystal clear to us that a thriving community includes people of all abilities. Um, but we really appreciate the opportunity to, to give you some more specifics about why that's absolutely true. So in closing for, for our part is there are chapters of the ARC around the state. There's, there's 15 of us, there's a state organization um, and we separate um, only so we can be specific in the areas we support. Um, so that Jefferson, Clear Creek and Gilpin do know their school districts, know their adult systems, know the, their connections with their city and council um, as long as we do with the Rapo and Douglas. Um, but we're, we're free organizations. We're here to help people. Again, as, as Brent said earlier, from birth to death and, and really to help you all if, as we branch into you know, 2022 and more and more inclusion and get back into the community. Thank yes, you. Go on. Sorry, Brent. I was just going to encourage people, um, council members, mayor, please 
reach out if we can help you in any way. Um, Colleen has our contact information and thanks again. Go ahead, Brent. Thank you for the winter. Do you have any questions about the concerns? Thank you so much for your uh, presentation and for uh, joining us tonight and come out and talking uh, to council and talking to the community. Uh, I appreciate uh, everything uh, all three of you uh, are, do for this community, for our community as a whole. So that's great to see that. Uh, does any, any council member have any questions or, or um, um, comments they'd like to make? Um, I do. Council Member Valdez, and then we'll get to Member Tom. Hey, Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That was very good. I, I just, on a personal note, my best friend from the time I was four was had a, a disability, and uh, it, was, it was very difficult for him, especially at a time back in the 60s and 70s as we were mostly growing up then. Uh, but he was able to do everything that just about everybody else could do. And, and now in, in my, my family alone, uh, my wife's side of the family, uh, she has a brother with a disability, and he can outski almost everybody I know. He, he's done the Olympics, and he's been, and I'm proud to say, he's been a uh, wrangler for the Greeley uh, Stampede for over 27 years. So uh, there's so many opportunities that that people need volunteers, and, and perhaps they they need to be aware if they can reach out to to the Ark that uh, you have a lot of folks that would love to volunteers. So thank you very much for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brent, in particular. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Yeah, I echo that. Thank you so much for um, spending your time with us and. Brent, it takes a lot of courage to talk in front of all of us. And so I appreciate your time and patience with us too. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, Valerie, I would love to get your contact information. So, and, and Brent and Luke's as well. We're working on some, um, we just had a, a discussion about this last week on how do we make our um, city more compliant and ADA friendly. So I'm wondering if there's some room there to engage you to help us do that, that work. So calling, I would love to have their information. Um, my second question is, who are the major service providers for um, in this area in Arapahoe and Douglas County for folks with disabilities? Uh, to start off, yeah, we, we'd love to par partner with you all. And, you know, you, Colleen has our information. Um, right. Service providers... Um, the community network within the system here in the state of Colorado for Medicaid um, for people with disability um, is mostly run through what are called community center boards. Um, and that would be developmental pathways for Arapahoe, Douglas County, and now Albert. Um, and then for uh, Jeffco, Gilpin, Clear Creek is what's called DDRC. And the acronym always escapes me, Valerie. Uh, developmental Disabilities Resource Center. Center, yeah. Um, those are the, the gatekeepers for Medicaid. They help pe essentially people get on and off Medicaid um, and kind of maintain services. And then there's over 200 different actual direct care providers, the people that were um, really working on trying to improve employment within, within that field of a career of people helping people with disabilities and getting you know, living wages, $15 an hour now um, under the waiver programs that people with, to help people with disabilities find jobs, Go, you know, attend to programs, even, you know, drive them to and from doctor's appointments. So um, there's too many of the lists that are actually the direct care staff that are the heart and soul of the disability world. And are they then, is it direct service in that they are reimbursed by Medicaid for that service? Yep. Or yeah, correct. Or philanthropic? Okay, got it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Barr, did I see your uh, hand up there? Yeah. Uh, Brent, Valerie, Luke, thank you guys so much again for your presentation. Uh, my wife works over at Newton as a speech therapist uh, alongside a lot of transition students. So um, I can tell you, you know, from the perspective of LPS, um, that I think our school districts very much take the, uh, you know, that job seriously and helping our friends and our neighbors transition into a, a life of, um, you know, not only acceptance, but of enjoyment and mobility and um, and, and just being partners and friends and neighbors in our community. Um, so beyond my rambling, I did want to throw an idea out there that, um, you know, unfortunately, as of last night, the vacant, the uh, opening to apply for authorities, boards and commissions, those uh, that window has closed for this coming year. Um, and had we been a day sooner, 
um, I would have said, you know, told Brent, you know, you should uh, quickly rush to our website to apply for one of those vacancies. But I hope in the future that, um, you know, your staff um, can keep an eye on those vacancies for our authorities, boards and commissions. Um, we would love to have uh, any and all of you uh, assisting, uh, helping us look to the future of fine arts, transportation, housing, um, and get your guys' voice in the room. So Brent, thank you for bringing up the fact that you sat on an RT RTD board. I think that skill set is incredibly valuable to bring to our city. Yeah, that might not do join next year. Do you need to live in the little that I live in Tampa? Uh, I believe yes, I believe you do need to live in Littleton, but hopefully through your network, uh, you know, if you have yeah, friends, obviously in the city, I do. Yeah. Well, please encourage them to apply. I hate to say that the cutoff was literally last night at 5 p.m. Though. Okay. Don't we have power to change that? I would have right? thought so. Like, yeah. <laughs> say it. Uh, city, city manager, did you have something to follow up on that? Or do you, um, do you want to cut in before the other council members here? Yeah, just quickly. <clears throat> I think... Uh, First of all, I, I just want to echo the same comments here for Brent, Luke, and Valerie. I think it's just a wonderful presentation and very timely. And to the Mayor Pro Tem's point, and really on behalf of all of Council, you know, I would be more than happy to engage you, along with Keith Reister, our Public Works Director. We just made a, a presentation to Council on updating our ADA transition plan. So we will reach out to you and look for an opportunity for you to engage in that process. We're just starting a public process on that. So your timing couldn't be any better. We would be delighted to, yeah, we, to provide input on that, absolutely. Our uh, Councilmember Milliman. Uh, Luke, Valerie, and Brent, thank you so much um, for presenting to us tonight. It was a fantastic presenta uh, presentation. And I can't thank you enough for spending the evening with us. I do wish we had a little bit more time, Brent, for you to share some of your humor, since uh, Valerie said that's one of the things she really likes about working with you, because we could always use a little lightness in our, our lives right now. But you'll have to come back. What's going now? <laughs> you'll have to come back. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councilman Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, Valerie, you had mentioned, or I'd mentioned at the beginning of this meeting about RTD having their financial struggles before COVID, during COVID, and, and, and it's even worse at this point. Are you or someone from ARC uh, in close contact with the ART, uh, AR, uh, RTD board uh, working to make sure that uh, your community is, is addressed? Most definitely. Um, Luke, it, sound, it looks like to me, I'm sensing that you have a lot to add to that, so go ahead. Yeah, we're part of the. We're part of um, par partnered with Dr. Mac. Um, so we work closely with them. We're uh, we're actually their advocacy member for that. With Dr. Mac, we're um, with we're with the Rappo County Transit Union. Uh, Dr. Union Mac. So yeah, Dr. Mac, and then uh, the Rappo County Transit Authority. So whatever that acronym is, okay. um, on a on a regular basis. Plus, um, working with our local RTD um, representatives to to make sure that you know um, the biggest struggle with people with disabilities isn't necessarily using the RTD system. It's, it's pretty you know efficient with that. It's the location of it. Um, and like tonight's going to be a, a hard night for people with disabilities, um, getting those, you know, bus stops, train stations uh, cleaned off so that they're a safe place for them to be, but also um, that they're within their their location. Um, Arapahoe County, we struggle with having sidewalks everywhere because um, Arapahoe County didn't really develop till a little bit later. So um, we work really closely with RTD to make sure that, you know, the key routes that people we know and serve, again, we don't serve every person with a disability, um, are still there because if we change one route, it, as you know, just for the local community, it impacts a lot of people how they access that bus or that, that RTD line. Thank you. Luke. We, we also expect that uh, Brent's participation on uh, the, the council um, can allow him to use his voice about, about making changes. Cause we do know that, um, participants who, uh, ride excessive ride, um, are having a bit more trouble because they, they just don't have enough drivers. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, we, we definitely keep abreast of 
of everything we can regarding transportation and we'll continue to. And I was on the Dodgemuck board for about four years. Again, the early 2010. Yeah, we took your spot. When Brent left, they reached out to ask for another chapter to be on. So Dr. Mack helps us out a lot to make sure we get our connections through yeah. to our TD. And I just had to look it up, Dr. Mack, for those uh, uh, listening, is the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Didn't get the wrong Dr. Mack there. So. Sorry, we live in a world of acronyms. Yes, yeah. yeah so, so do we, just different acronyms <laughs> sometimes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, uh, anybody else, any other council members have any questions or comment? Great. I just want to thank you one more time. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, my wife makes her, we, we live a few blocks from uh, the Arc Thrift Store here in Littleton and my wife makes her weekly Saturday morning trek over there every week. <laughs> we definitely uh, do our part. <laughs> Sometimes a little too much. Take one last push for Arc Thrift, if I could, Mayor. I mean, Arc Thrift, yeah. the money stays here. hundred percent stays in Colorado. It's not like any other thrift stores. They do amazing work too, but um, the money is a local chapter. It's, we're one of the only states with an ARC um, thrift. It's it's ours to here in the state of Colorado. We have one store on the Western Slope. Um, the other 29 are along the Front Range. Um, they are the biggest employer of pe for people with disability in the state. Over 300 individuals with disabilities work for ARC thrift in all aspects of the job, from the front to the back to the you know corporate st structure. So, um, and they are our funding source um, for every chapter across the state. Um, is the primary funding source is thrift. So the more you shop, donate, and support thrift, and even during the the pandemic, thrift went out and did a lot of you know help with food banks because we have small trucks, we can get in places those big food bank trucks can't get into, and hospitals. And thank you to our first responders and things. So um, thrift is a is a life scent and a life blood for our th uh, advocacy organizations. Now that I think my jacket came from there, actually, I think this is what I got. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> Most of our wardrobes do, Mayor. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome to uh, stay for the rest of the evening and listen to everything that we're doing. Um, but uh, thank you. And if you could, uh, I just ask you to turn off your uh, camera and microphone, and we'll get back to our meeting. So have a great evening, and uh, don't let the snow uh, uh, get you down here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. All right, let's see. We are on to item number five, which is the public comment portion of the meeting. I'll have our moderator jump back in here and let the public know how they can participate. Thank you, Mayor. If you wish to address City Council, please call 669-900-6833. And when prompted, enter the webinar ID 960-18. 140586. Press star nine to raise your hand and be recognized as a speaker. Citizen microphones will be automatically muted until the citizen is called upon by the last three digits of their phone number. When called on to speak, please state your name and district or address clearly for the record. Public comment is an opportunity to express opinions or ask questions regarding issues that are not part of public hearings on tonight's agenda. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. The city clerk will notify you when you have 30 seconds remaining and again when your time is up. The city council is not authorized under the Colorado Open Meetings Law to discuss, comment, or take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. The mayor may refer the matter to the city manager and or city attorney for immediate comment after public comment or to staff to obtain additional information and report back to the council as appropriate. We expect comments to be civil, disrespectful or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. We currently have no hands raised in the queue for public comment. And again, I'll remind our, our attendees to press nine to raise your hand and be recognized as a speaker. Just have a comment for council, just remember be patient that there's a slight delay when they get off the phone uh, to speak okay. there. 
Um, there and, is some hands raised in the Zoom here, so I don't know if you yes. can call in. Okay. And so I can see those three hands raised. So I'd like to begin, please, with caller 493. It's first in line, and then caller 936 will be on deck. Again, please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking. Caller 493. Good evening, City Council. This is Frank Atwood. I live in District 4, and I'm commenting on uh, Topic 7B this evening and concerned that you only have two options of, of um, rather than a third option of having done it the way uh, what I thought was precedence with the Walmart election. and. Although it's mentioned, um, I don't feel it's adequately explained and look forward to it being adequately explained as to why um, it's not the Walmart precedence isn't being followed. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening and thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Next, I have caller 936. Please press star six to unmute yourself. And our next caller will be 819. A good snowy evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Lynn Christensen and I live in District 3. I am in favor of repealing the Newton Property Aspen Grove Fourth Amendment Ordinance. However, if council votes not to repeal the ordinance, I am in favor of a special election to be conducted for registered electors, which I believe is to be not more than 150 days after the final determination of petition sufficiency. I canvassed for the citizens petition and talked to a lot of people. I can count on one hand the number of people who would not sign the petition. One said he worked in the industry, so was benefiting financial from the redevelopment, and another thought by building a glut of apartment units, his rent would decrease. Let me point out the obvious and say that both reasons were pretty self-serving. Council, you can save the staff a lot of time and voters a lot of money if you simply repeal the ordinance. There were many concerns from both citizens and council members who initially voted against the Aspen Grove rezoning amendment. I want to highlight one this evening. I have personally spoken to staff members at Carson Nature Center and an environmental scientist who said the wildlife in South Platte Park is already being impacted by the amount of human interface. They are very worried the cumulative effect of high density housing, traffic, noise, pollution, et cetera, from all the proposed developments along the entire stretch of Santa Fe Drive will have long-term negative effects to the wetlands and wildlife. Whether the rezoning amendment is repealed or put on a ballot for voters, I am asking city council to direct city staff to have an environmental study conducted that would determine the cumulative impacts from all proposed developments along the South Platte River corridor, and then the conclusions reflected in enforceable code le legislation within the ULUC. A beautiful jewel of Littleton is at stake as well as the quality of life of citizens and the fate of businesses. They all matter. Citizens said no to 2,000 housing units and a 50% decrease in commercial space during the Planning Commission and City Council public hearings. They said no again by signing the petition. Council, will you please listen to the citizens of your city? Thank you so much for your time this evening. Lynn? And finally, we have one hand raised. If anyone else would like to participate in public comment, again, please, rate, please press star nine to raise your hand. Our final participant is, oh, we have one more. So caller 819, and then next will be caller 530. Caller 819, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, Council. This is Pam Chubborn. I live a block in Athens City Center. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Lynn for her statement. Um, and I endorse what she said 100%. Uh, maybe you can find a grant 
to help pay for that environmental study. And that should motivate some people at the city. Um, please do that. And Lynn is totally correct. Um, council knows that there were many citizens <clears throat> who spoke against uh, Aspen Grove rezoning the first time. I uh, do think that repealing the rezoning is the right thing to do. Um, I did have a question, why is it general business and not a um, public hearing? Discussions of the options should be heard by the public and then open to the public input and we would be able to hear your discussions and then comment if it was um, a public hearing. And uh, the rezoning I'm gonna say is, has always been invalid. There are at least two compelling reasons to repeal it. The first one is that the reduction in the requirement for commercial use should be a non-starter for this council. Most cities require retail taxes to remain financially solvent. Littleton is not unusual or weak in this respect. We are normal. We should value and nourish a vibrant commercial environment in the city, not sacrifice commercial to residential. It is our legacy. We are a working city, and that should be a source of pride. Littleton cannot survive on property taxes like Columbine Valley, and we shouldn't aspire to do that. The citizens on city council as representatives of our current and future taxpayers are obligated to act to provide financial sustainability for the city. You've got to have more commercial required in that location. The second compelling reason is that 2,000 housing units is very dense. It's an excessive concession to the applicant. When a city makes concessions, the city should get significant value in return. Incentives work both ways. This, any rezoning here, should include a requirement that the residences include specific reasonable percentages of below market rate housing and housing accessible to disabled individuals. And I swear to you, I wrote that before I heard the uh, comment tonight. 30 seconds. This site is next to the Mineral Light Ray Station. Housing for people with low income and mobility challenges must be required by the city. This is, should not be open to debate and it should never have been passed without those requirements in the first place. Um, so new council, please take a lesson from the success of the petition and the disapproval of thousands of voters. The previous council was far That's out of step time. from public opinion. Um, please fix this tonight. Thank you. Ma'am? Mayor, we have two hands remaining. Um, so I'm gonna start with caller 530. Please press star six to unmute yourself. And then we'll be next with caller 023. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Yeah, I am uh, wanted to address everything that was occurring with the uh, current council. I live in the district where the museum is. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hello? Is the caller still there? can see that the caller is connected, but there's... Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Yeah, we yes. can hear you now. Can you, can okay. you please introduce yourself? I had yourself? a malfunction. I had, yes, my name's Jim, and I live in the district where the museum is. That involved well, what's, with a little what's bit What's your name, late. sir? Jim? What's your name? I live in the district where the museum is. Can you hear me? I, I didn't hear, what's your name? I'm, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I missed that. It's Jim, and I live in the district where the museum is. Okay, thank you. Sorry, we uh, got involved with this a little bit late and unfortunately found out some things that occurred with the Aspen Grove development, which lacked what I understand, feasibility study, the traffic for wildlife migration, uh, also the Littleton community in, in a whole from what I'm hearing has not been able to voice their opinions openly about the impact of 2,000 units 
on a very small property of just very small acreage on Santa Fe. Our family moved to Littleton in 1912 and had the property across from St. Mary's Church and made a conscious decision to move to Littleton then and have survived that time. The big difference between Aspen Grove redevelopment of 2,000 residential units and other facilities in the South Metro area is that I believe that people moved to Littleton because of its environment and the lack of high density. The antithesis of that is, say, the community across the way, South Park, which is down on Jackass Hill. Well-spaced, townhomes, uh, high-quality living, and an asset to Littleton as a community. I also believe that the downtown Littleton historic, or the business community, will be impacted heavily by high-density housing. Not to mention the fact that Santa Fe would be a pure traffic jam every morning when people drove to work. The other thing that we found when we were talking to people in the community, our neighbors, is that Littleton is full of disabled people. I am most compelled by your previous presentation, by ARC. I don't know another place where disabled people will have a good opportunity to be in Littleton, safely go to light rail, and I do want to under, underline safety. 30 seconds. Because we do businesses in other parts. And then secondly, this should be open to the public. There should be a special vote. And high density, low square footage apartments will be nothing but a detriment to Littleton as a community. And we've, we've moved back into Littleton for that reason, for high quality lifestyle with excellent neighbors. And I um, thank you for your time. And this is a tough, tough task, but we appreciate your hard work. Thank you. And Mayor, our final caller is last digit 023. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Good evening. My name is Linda Knufinke, and I live just north of Aspen Grove in the 4th District. You have to go through Aspen Grove to get to my house. I would publicly like to thank everybody involved in the process of attaining signatures for the Aspen Grove petition. I had the distinct honor and privilege of working alongside many people who came from all over Littleton to sign the petition. I'm in awe of the petition gatherers who collect many, many signatures in a short period of time. Some went door to door and they told me almost all people were eager to sign the petition. I experienced the same. It was heartening to know that from folks from all different ages signed the petition. So petition gatherers went to the state's best election attorney to get her opinion on when the election should occur. After careful reading and understanding Littleton's charter and her intricate knowledge of the state election law, she determined Littleton should hold a special election. So to respect those that signed the petition, we feel that a special election should be held not less than 60 days and not more than 150 days after the determination of sufficiency on January 7, 2022. Again, to respect those that signed the petition, we feel that a special election should be held within a reasonable time frame. The November election is almost 11 months from the date the city clerk provided a certificate of sufficiency. 11 months is way too long. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Kathleen, are there any other callers? There are no additional callers. Thank you, Mayor. All right, oh, thank you. So uh, let's see. Um, City manager and city attorney, do you have any response uh, to any of the public comment? Uh, probably a lot of what you'll say would be covered in uh, uh, the agenda item later. Yeah, Mayor, I have no comment. I would defer to the city attorney. Okay, the attorney. Um, you know, I'll just uh, speak to a couple of items. I will get into Ms. Newfinke's um, comments and her consultation with uh, this election attorney uh, during the presentation. Um, to Mr. Atwood's comments about why we have established some precedents in Walmart and we're not following that, you know, my review back in 2007, we're actually kind of one step ahead of what was done in Walmart. Um, 
at Walmart, it was basically brought to city council after the petition, after the signatures were, were deemed valid and the choice was given to city council at that time, which was, do you want me to prepare an ordinance or do you want to do a resolution referring it to the voters? And the direction was bring back a resolution referring to the voters. So in this case, given our limited time frame that we have in regard to council uh, schedules, I didn't think it was appropriate to uh, potentially waste a month uh, getting that direction and not having first reading until March 1st. So that's why that item was before us tonight as an option for city council's consideration. Um, to Ms. Chadbourne's uh, comments about why this is in the public hearing, well, this is first reading. If council elects to set the ordinance for a um, uh, repealing this, it'll be set for a public hearing and the citizens will be given the opportunity to give their input. It's typical as we would see with any consent item. So the options that council has as we'll get into is um, setting the public hearing to repeal it or referring it to the electors. Those are council's options that they can entertain uh, tonight and we'll see what happens. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to item six, the consent agenda items. Uh, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. We have uh, five items. Uh, a, ordinance two, 2022, an ordinance on first reading, amending ordinance 27, series 2021, known as the annual appropriation bill for all municipal purposes of the city of Littleton, counties of Arapaho, Douglas, and Jefferson, state of Colorado, for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2022, and ending December 31st, 2022. B, ID 2227, motion to approve amendments to the protocols and standards of conduct and the legislative rules. C, ID 2224, motion to cancel city council's regular meetings on February 15th, 2022, and March 15th, 2022. D, ID 229, motion to approve minutes of the January 4th, 2022 regular meeting. E, ID 2215, motion to approve minutes of the January 18th, 2022 special meeting. A motion in a second. Mayor, I move to approve consent agenda items A, B, C, D, E. Second. Let's go second. Uh, we have, let's see, Councilmember Valdez, you have a, a comment or question on these? Yes, thank you. Uh, to the city attorney, I, I thought I heard you say that the reason this, the, the 7B was not, it, it, 7B is a first reading, and that's why it's on consent. Um, I, I think you may have misspoke. Is that what I heard? Was that correct? Is that what you said? Because it, it is an under consent. Per, correct, uh, Councilmember Valdez. What I meant to say if I misspoke was that this is similar to what we would do under consent when we have a first reading on an ordinance. Those typically fall in line under our consent agenda items. As this has a presentation in front of it, uh, that's why it was moved to general business um, to discuss the matter and give council the option of um, proceeding to the ordinance on first reading or in the alternative uh, to refer the matter under a resolution to the registered electors of the city of Littleton. So is, is it in fact a first reading then? You have the option of this being a first reading. That is okay. It would be, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. That's so seven B is not on the consent agenda there. Um, so we're just dealing with uh, six A, B, C, D, and E. We have uh, any other questions about that? Okay, we have a uh, motion and a second. Clerk, can I call the vote? A uh, thumbs up is a yes vote. A thumbs down is a no. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, now we are moving on to uh, item seven, which is our general business. Uh, we have two items here under general business. Uh, first item is uh, resolution 11, 2022. 
That's a resolution approving a contract with Cooperative Personnel Services. Uh, DBA is CPSHR for the City Manager Recruitment Services. Uh, we will have a um, short presentation by staff and then council can ask questions and then we'll need a motion and a second and a vote. Turn it over to Mark. Okay, Mayor, are we ready here? Yep. yep. Okay, all right, thank you, Mayor, Council. As uh, Council's aware, I made um, notice here late last year of my uh, pending retirement here, June 1st. And so we've been working with Council here on a process here to hire a recruiter specifically to uh, fill my position. And I'm just gonna turn this over to Noelle Mink, our HR director. She's been working the process here along with council. She has a short presentation and uh, Noelle. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening. So in relation to this item, um, as a reminder, in December, we met uh, with council and we received direction to do a modified type of uh, RFP. So HR took that task and we went out and we vetted uh, several um, search firms and we received documentation from four and in January 18th, you received uh, presentations from three of those folks. CPSHR was the leading and you asked us to do background check on them or not background, reference checks. And we conducted those, they came back stellar. We did specific checks also on the person that was appointed as our lead contact, um, which is Melissa Asher. And so we conducted those and everything came back sell our very good references. Uh, you also directed us to move forward uh, with the contract and to bring it back to you, um, which you have before you. You'll notice that the cost is a $25,000 flat professional fee plus expenses. And so expenses are things like travel when we pay for travel for uh, CPSHR or candidates. Um, this is a little bit more difficult to give an exact number on because it could vary. Should council choose to bring in five candidates instead of three, um, obviously that cost would be adjusted. So it is the $25,000 flat fee plus expenses. Is there any questions that I can answer? Do you have any questions uh, on this? I don't have questions. Thank, uh, I just wanna say thank you for putting the work out, you know, looking forward to working with uh, this group here, uh, CPS, so um, and try to get this, uh, show on the road here and get to work and selecting our new replacement who's got some big shoes to fill. That's right. All right, well then, uh, can we get a um, motion uh, on this? To approve resolution 11? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 11-2022, approving an agreement with the Cooperative Personnel Services, DBA, CPS, HR for city manager recruitment services. Second. Oh. Got council member Barr making the motion, council member Valdez with a second. Um, any discussion from council? Anyone have anything to add about this? Seeing none, I'll call the vote here. Thumbs up is a yes, thumbs down is a no. The vote is six in favor, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, item uh, 7B, uh, which is, uh, so this is kind of a, we're, we're here because of a, a referendum on an ordinance that the previous city council passed uh, late last year. And we have kind of several options. That's why uh, we've got um, a, a few different documents here and actions that we could possibly take here. Um, but this is all pretty well laid out in the city charter and city code. And so the city attorney is going to uh, kind of provide us with uh, what, our, what our choices are. And then we can go ahead and kind of ask some questions of the city attorney, city manager, until we kind of figure out which uh, avenue uh, council would like to take. And then um, we can move forward from that regard there. City attorney. Are, are you, are you going to read the ID number and all that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. ID 22. Uh, 18, uh, submitting to city council options to address a referendum petition regarding the Newton property, Aspen Grove, 
um, on Ordinance 3 of 2022, an ordinance on first reading repealing Ordinance 22 of 2021, which approved a fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, or Resolution 10 of 2022, referring a ballot question to the registered electors, um, shall Ordinance 22 2021, which approved the fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, be approved. Now to the city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I thought it would be good to just kind of lay out the background in, in regard to this item. So back on November 9th, City Council uh, voted to approve, as you mentioned, the Fourth Amendment to the Newton, the Newton Property uh, GPDP, which is the General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, which generally allowed for residential uses uh, in addition to the existing commercial zoning on that property, among other things. Uh, following the passage of that ordinance, a group of petitioners sought to avail themselves of the Littleton City Charter referendum procedure. Um, you know, and as I've mentioned before, generally a referendum allows for citizens to go through a process that refers legislative acts uh, done by council um, to the, the registered electors if it's not repealed. And that's what was done in this case. So case law calls that rezonings are legislative in nature, uh, which allows for petitioners to challenge those actions um, that are specifically enacted by way of ordinance. So what our city charter states, what our city, city charter's referendum states is that the referendum applies to all ordinances passed by the city council, uh, except those uh, dealing with tax levies and the annual appropriation ordinance. And what it requires is that if within 30 days after the publication following final passage of an ordinance to which a referendum is applicable, a petition signed by the registered electors uh, equal in numbers to at least 10% of the number of registered electors to vote in the last general municipal election is presented to council protesting any ordinance going into effect, it shall thereupon be suspended and the council shall reconsider such ordinance. If the ordinance is not entirely repealed, the council shall submit it to a vote of the registered electors of the city. Um, and as provided in that initiative, which is uh, not really artfully worried, uh, worded, it should be referendum, um, at the next general municipal election or special election called therefore. So as, you know, in regard to, to that, so based upon the previous election numbers that were provided by the counties, the number of verified signatures, the number of signatures that our petitioners needed to collect was 3,588 signatures. And on December 13th, uh, the petitioners submitted 4,207 signatures. Of those, the city clerk went in to verify that they were actually registered electors within the city of Littleton and 3,729 were indeed legitimate. Um, our city clerk verified those signatures officially on January 7th. So based upon the sufficiency of the petition that was submitted, council has two options before it tonight. Option one is council can pass the ordinance on first reading, repealing the fourth amendment to the GB, the GP. DP, see, I'm going to get my own acronyms messed up, the general plan development plan uh, to the Newton property, Aston Grove, and set it for a public hearing. Um, and taking a look at what our current council calendar is with uh, various boards and commission meetings happening, it would be March 1st. That's option one that council can consider. Or based upon our charter language, council may pass a resolution referring the matter to the registered electors, and, and this is our charter language, at the next general municipal election, which would be November of 2023. That is 22 months away. Or they can set it for a special election. On the latter, we've heard a couple of mentions from Ms. Christensen wanting this within 150 days, as well as Ms. Newfinky, um, who, who spoke as to um, her comments with, a, with an attorney regarding when this should be set. Uh, on the latter, 
I will say that state law, which is being referenced, which is CRS 3111-104, calls for special elections to be held no sooner than 60 days and no later than 150 days. Now, with that said, our Littleton City Code, Section 1 set 1-7-6 specifically states, and I'll quote, parent A, non-applicability, Article 11 of Title 31, Colorado Revised Statutes, shall have no applicability to any city initiative or referendum. As such, based upon our home rule status, our city code, and our city charter's language, which is essentially our city's constitution, there's a, a particular person who used to come in here for public comment, uh, and, and say that same thing and it has been long been emphasized it's my legal opinion that council has the option to set this for november of 2023 or move that date up um, that date is currently proposed in the resolution to be november 8th that is you know in conjunction with the state election um, and it is hoped that the city could then coordinate our election in conjunction with those counties on November 8th. Now that data has been recommended by staff for a number of reasons, including but not limited to expense, time, efficiency, uh, increased voter turnout, and the potential for additional ballot issues or questions to also be placed on that date. So all of which uh, staff can speak to. That said, um, the decision as to when to have a special election is up to council in this particular case. So, you know, both myself, city manager, and our city clerk, Colleen Norton, are available to answer any questions that you might have in regard to this. Item. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, council. Now would be the time to ask any questions to clarify any issues you have with either East or get you kind of honed in on what you think might be the proper avenue here. Does anyone have any questions? Or I'll, I will, uh, if no one does, I'll, I'll give you some time and I'll start off with the question um, to the city attorney. So the ordinance that was passed last year, this was done via quasi-judicial um, uh, process, correct? That is correct. Okay. And how does that process play in with uh, council reconsidering it and or, um, you know, with new members? I know three of the people um, on the call tonight on the council weren't a part of that process. Um, if we are reconsidering uh, that ordinance, is there, what, is there any issue with that? You know, I would say that it does present um potentially some some challenges from a legal risk standpoint um you know as i the current council we have three members who initially voted in favor of this council member grove who is not here was one who voted against it um you know for my review a city council reconsidering that would I'm not sure what they would be basing their reconsideration on, how, why they would have changed their mind between when they, they heard the facts at a hearing and applied it to a criteria, what would have changed. Uh, for the three new members on city council, you're really two and a half, um, Mayor Schlachter. But, you know, I think- Wasn't well, a part of that previous council, so. We're correct, but not part of the previous council. Um, what I think would need to happen is that uh, a council person, a new council person would have to go back and review the hearing and base their decision on those public hearings. So however many hours of, of public testimony we had, I know it was split over a couple of nights, but based upon that, base their decisions upon that and then filter out everything that may have been shared or learned, you know, as you've campaigned conversations that you had with constituents, um, you know, everything that's happened since, you know, mm -hmm since November 9th, basically, or and actually we, we stopped the cutoff in October. So that'd be um, a particular challenge in council reconsidering it. I can't say, I won't say that it can't be done. Um, it certainly makes it a little bit more interesting. I'll call that it. Pre the previous council made the decision based on very 
specific criteria because it was a quasi judicial. And so uh, reconsidering and potentially repealing would, would it need to be based, you know, either changing a vote or, or changing the, the group's vote. Um, it would theoretically need to be based on a criteria that was um, presented at that time. That would be that would be my opinion. It would seem um, risky to suddenly change your vote because you you got ten percent of the registered electors to sign um, a petition. I don't know if that would be appropriate criteria. To... And I'll get to you in a second, Councilmember Driscoll. And so you said there would be legal liability or legal risk. I think is what you said. Well, <laughs> there's a there's legal risk in everything we do. Oh, that's true. That there's but would it be problems. out of the realm of possibility for the applicant to then um, sue the city for changing the ordinance? Possibly as arbitrary or depending on yeah, that's always a, a concern. Okay. okay. Um, Councilman Driscoll. Yes, we're going down that same line of thought. If we were to open that back up to this council, and this council approved um, approve the change, what would stop the public from going out and doing exactly what they just did? And that's raising signatures again, and once again repealing it, or you know, asking it to get go to the voters. Is would we just be in this same boat down the road? Not on, not on this item. Um, specifically, they've had an opportunity uh, within those 30 days to to collect those signatures. Right now, the status of the item is, is that it was approved by council. It's now deemed suspended. Um, you know, to answer your question, if council decided to repeal, could the applicant in this case file their own? I think it's complicated. I, legally, theoretically, I suppose it's possible. They could come back, they can present to council, and we can, again, once again, vote. Okay. Uh, Councilor Driscoll, were you saying if we reconsider and vote and vote to affirm the previous decision? Is that what you were saying? Yes. Okay. I don't think well, that, I, I don't think that's no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, not in that. No, I, I went down two different roads there, Kyle, but okay. yes, that's one of them. The other one was to uh, have start the whole process over again with the uh, with the uh, applicant making, with the owner making a new application. I think uh, I think you're just asking if we, because the term is reconsider, um, we can reconsider. I think if we would do that, it would basically say, we're not gonna repeal it and we go to the voters. We don't have an option to say, sorry, we override it. Um, it either has to be repealed in its entirety or Go to the voters. I don't think we have an option to say we hear you. We're going to reaffirm it. Yeah, if if okay. council does not repeal it and it's entirely, you are required. Council is required to refer it to the registered electors. Uh, Councilmember Milliman. Uh, Reed. So the second option was. Um, refer the referendum to the registered electors of the city at the next general municipal election, which would be November of 2023, correct? Correct. And, and what I'm reading from specifically is our city charter. That's what okay. it, it states. That if it's not entirely repealed, that the council shall submit to a vote for the registered electors of the city as the right of blah, 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 at the next general municipal election or at a special election called therefore. And so the special election would be this coming November. That would be special for us because it is not one of our general municipal elections. So okay. what makes it special is it's not one of our general municipal elections. So in, in your opinion, and maybe Mark can chime in on this, on this as well, do you feel like, um, you know, I feel like Garrity um, should have the ability to present to the public what they're proposing. Um, and I, I know that there were some myths, truth, myth, God, I can't speak, mistruths or mis, uh, misleading information um, to some folks that signed this petition. And so I feel like, um, you know, Garrity should be given 
a fair chance and opportunity to um, present that, to present their their proposal to the public. Will that give them enough time if if we if we allowed this to go to this special election this November, or should we push it out to November of 2023 to give them that opportunity? Just asking. Uh, city manager? City manager is, is hiding. Yeah. Yeah. His hand is hidden in the leaves there. Go ahead. Uh, Council member, you know, I offer my opinion for what it's worth. And, um, our city attorney can certainly add his perspective. You know, it is staff's recommendation that a special election be held in November of this year to consider this issue if you want to refer it to the voters. I think for lots of reasons and everything that the city attorney kind of articulated there. We have a retreat coming up here in a couple of weeks. We are, are suggesting that the council consider some other potential ballot issues. Uh, we have the ability to obviously coordinate with the county in November reduces our costs significantly. And so there's just a lot of things in motion there that just kind of make sense. Plus you have just higher turnout. I think it's an issue that's important enough that we should maximize the opportunity for our citizens to vote. And uh, I think just November is that maximum opportunity. I think it also uh, provides an opportunity for really both sides, both parties here to present whatever information in a timely manner and not try to force an outcome here in what I would say probably a shorter period of time you know, 90 days or May or something. So again, that's just my opinion and some of the reasoning uh, behind, I guess, the staff recommendation. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, Councilmember Valdez, then Mayor Pro Tem Ryden, and then Councilmember Barr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, if, if now's a good time to talk about the ordinance, I'd like to make a couple comments on that. If, are we okay with talking about the ordinance at this point? Uh, I'm just trying to see what we're gonna, I mean, move forward with. Do you have questions okay. about the ordinance or? Well, in, in regards to the ordinance, yeah. I, I think since we only have three council members that are here tonight that sat through the entire public hearing, uh, I, I think for a new council to override tonight, the, the previous council's decision on an issue that was very complex and, and, and is, it was a tough decision for all seven council members at the time, uh, I think it'd be an unwise move of this council. I think that this issue should go to the citizens. Um, I think the citizens can make an informed decisions after they've studied the facts. There's some stuff out there that maybe isn't as factual as it should be. So I think it, giving the citizens a chance to uh, study the facts um, before making a decisions, making a decision that is best for the city of Littleton. It isn't just for one specific area necessarily. It is for the city of Littleton. I think uh, so that with that in, in, in mind, uh, I'm not in favor of moving the ordinance forward at all. Um, I am, though, I am interested in moving the resolution and referring it to the citizens uh, come November uh, 2022. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Yeah, I agree with fellow council member uh, Valdez on that, that it should go to the voters. Um, my question for Reed or Mark is how much would it cost if it was done during the between the 60 and 150 days, how much would it cost if it was done this November? And how much would it would cost if it was done in November 2023? So I hand roughly, up. roughly. You're on mute, Colleen. Thank you. Um, I can speak to that. If we were to run a special election um, prior to the coordinated election in November, we're looking at um, a number somewhere in the 60, 65,000 range um, that would cover uh, printing of ballots, mailing of ballots, paying for return postage, hiring election judges, renting equipment, um, all of those kinds of things, um, and probably bringing in additional staffing as well. Uh, if we run it in November of this year, we're looking at an amount similar to what we paid for our 2021 election, which was 26,000. And if we run it in 2023, it's probably still gonna be in that 26 to $28,000 range. So a little less than, than um, half of what a standalone election would. So is my math right, is that about $40,000 different? Yeah. Ish. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little less than, than half. It's 
Yeah, okay. it's it's a considerable amount. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councilmember Barr. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, actually alluding to some of the questions you brought up with the city attorney previously uh, with regards to uh, potential litigation, um, do we know, you know, uh, city attorney, I'm not asking for your daily rate as to what you charge, but do you have an approximation as to what the fiscal impact would be if litigation were to be brought forth uh, upon repealing um, this, this ordinance? I mean, I, that's a very obviously amorphous question, but I suspect it would cost more than $25,000. Well, without really getting into it, I, I will say depending on what the nature of the action, sometimes we can we can get attorney's fees, sometimes we can't. Most of the times uh, we can't. And everyone takes their own losses, so to speak, and their own costs and, and uh, away we go. I'm not going to speculate as to uh, attorney's fees. We have, yeah. I mean, we have litigation matters that you know last years and years and years and years, and that obviously gets a little bit more expensive. But I, I won't, I won't comment on that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I do want to just uh, tacking off of that same subject matter, and I think uh, echoing what uh, Council Member Valdez has already said as well. Um, I did not sit on that vote in previous council. Um, I have received a whole ton of information from citizens both for and against it, but regardless, I did receive a, a ton of information that was not part of the quasi-judicial process that was set forth when previous council made their decision. And I know, uh, as council member Valdez alluded to, how difficult that decision was based on the facts that were presented um, and would not feel comfortable in a position to uh, repeal that decision um, because, quite honestly, that would be just truly flying in the face of the previous council's decisions as well. Um, and I would like to at least take the opportunity to explore what uh, you know what options we do have with regards to balloting. And I think it was uh, you know brought up as well that the purpose of this petition process was to hear the voices of citizens of Littleton. Um, in my mind, that means it is our job as council to maximize the number of citizens that we hear from if we were to put this to a ballot initiative. Um, the best way to do that is to have it coincide with other issues that are also occurring on the ballot to maximize that voter turnout, which in my mind is actually the purpose and why the petition was put out there in the first place. People want to hear what the citizens have to think. And I think it's our job to to put that forward. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I echo what uh, Councilmember Valdez said, you know, the fact that three of us here right now weren't a part of that whole public hearing. And for those that don't understand that, you know, quasi judicial public hearings are very, very specific for what they do, very defined. And there's a very defined criteria. And the fact that, um, you know, we I, I don't see the criteria to repeal it based on that. And I wasn't part of the discussion there. So I, I would not um, be comfortable uh, repealing the ordinance. Um, and, you know, that's also kind of what uh, what I heard uh, when petitioners were going on was that the whole case was to be made as sent it to the voters, sent it to the voters. And I think that I was my understanding. That's what they wanted was to go to the voters. Um, I realized there was an option to repeal, but uh, I think the most logical um, option and you know the one that best supports our council goals of good governance um, this would be this would fit in there as good governance to to put it towards uh to the ballot uh there and so that's what i'm leaning towards is um you know moving forward with uh, uh the resolution and, and not to set uh, uh ordinance for public hearing and to repeal uh councilmember valdez uh, Mayor, could you go ahead and ask maybe a, a, for a motion on your ordinance? I was going to see if anyone had any other questions, and I just wanted to see. Um, let's just go through the agenda here. Does any would anyone like to uh, introduce uh, the ordinance three twenty twenty two, an ordinance on first reading repealing ordinance twenty twenty two twenty twenty one, which approved the fourth amendment to the Newton property uh, general plan development plan, Aspen Grove. Going once. Twice, third. All right. So, 
Uh, the ordinance dies due to a lack of a motion to introduce it. And so that leaves us with uh, resolution 10 of 2022, referring a ballot question to the registered, vo uh, registered electors, shall ordinance 2022-2021, which approved a fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, be approved. Second. I will, well, okay, yeah, second, I'll, I'll take that motion. Um, and then- um, Was there a motion for, I'm sorry, for the resolution? There was no motion. Yeah, oh. I was just reading it. We, I was just reading it, but I, you know, do, Pat, Patrick, do you want to make the motion? I, then? Sure, I'll be happy to reread that for you. Uh, I make a motion to uh, refer a ballot, uh, let's see, resolution 10, uh, 22, 2022, referring a ballot question to the registered electors shall ordinance 22-2021, which approved a fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, be approved. Second. second. Councilman Barr seconds it. Or, or did you include the, a possible date in that motion? It's in the resolution, I believe, isn't it? Well, right. it's gotta be in the motion. Uh, Mayor, if I may, um, Reed, did we want to, did we not have a revised motion that we discussed earlier? I, 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 can I reread the motion, uh, Council Member Driscoll? Absolutely. Okay, I move to approve resolution 10-2022 referring to a registered electors a ballot question, SAL ordinance 22-2021 with approval, with approved a fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan, Aspen Grove, be approved at an election to be held November 8, 2022. Second. Got that, I must have opened the, uh, the wrong thing here. Apologize for that. So we have a motion and a second. Right, clerk. Okay, uh, thumbs up. Is well, I, I just I um just wanted to um you know. Do you, do you want me to reread the motion? Does anyone you need to reread the motion? I can absolutely. Uh, Council Member Valdez moved and Council Member Driscoll seconded uh, to approve resolution 10 2022, which refers to the registered electors of the city of Littleton, a ballot question regarding ordinance 2020, I'm sorry, 22 2021, which approved a fourth amendment to the Newton Property General Plan Development Plan at an election to be held on November 8th, 2022. And before we took the vote, I just wanted to see if anyone had any comments or any, if there's any further discussion. Um, I know it's in there as November. Um, the two comments I wanted to make is there are way too many 20s and the word planned in this uh, uh, resolution here. So I, I do disapprove of that. But uh, um, I think, you know, November 8th of 2022 is is the ideal time. You know, it's within the charter to put it to 2023, mm -hmm. which that just seems a bit absurd to wait that long to do anything. And the fact that uh, we 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 could, it's within our power to move it up to within 60 to 150 days. But the fact that there are going to be special district ballots, there's going to be primary ballots this uh, spring. We're likely to have issues on the November ballot anyways. Um, we'll discuss that at the retreat. I think having it all um, at the same time this November um, is, makes, is the most logical thing to do. So that's why I'm like the November 8th date. All right. Any other any other comments? Seeing none. Oh, great. Oh, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, you're moving yeah. around. I'll I'll uh, I'll second that. Forty thousand dollars as a difference. I have more ideas for where to spend that money. That's not on a election that we could have in November. So I think just to be fiscally responsible, I think is important here too to consider. Um, and so that again makes the case for a November election. Yeah. And one. Le oh, I asked the city attorney is um, the. Um, the ballot title, will that be, and, and the ballot language, will that all be refined um, moving forward? Yeah, when we set this um, in August, we'll bring back the official ballot language as it's going to appear. We need to have something pretty specific as it relates to how it's going to appear on the ballot. So uh, when we're setting everything in August, uh, that's when it will be brought back before council for its, I guess, official approval again. But the direction we have is that this is going on a November 8th ballot. Um, if there's some refinement to the language, then that'll occur in August. So oh, in August with any refinement, that'll be when we make the agreements with the counties. Uh, it's going to be a coordinated election. And so that will 
Cor um, correct. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a deadline in which we need to, any municipalities who are going to be coordinating elections, there, there's a deadline in which we need to provide that information to the county so that they can um, have that on their ballots. And it's typically, I don't know, Colleen can, can correct me, but it's, you know, 60, 75, 90 days out um, that we need to have that to the county. That clear for everyone here and everyone listening. All right. All right. So then I, um, I see no other discussion. So let's call the question here. A vote, a thumbs up is a vote in favor of moving resolution forward to place this on the November ballot. A thumbs down is a vote against. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you. Um, item eight, uh, ordinances on second reading and public hearing. Uh, we have none tonight. And so no other business. Uh, we are adjourned at 819. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Enjoy this. <laughs>